Well, Kyle, Graham, Mark, thanks again for uh, our quarterly review of your earnings. Thank you for uh, joining me on this and uh, being available to just answer some uh, in the in depth uh, questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, before we start, I want to give a warning uh, for anyone listening or watching that uh, I am wrong a lot. And please do your own due diligence. Uh, I am an investor in Glasshouse. I've done my own due diligence. Uh, I am very bullish on this. Please make sure that you do your own work and you know if you are an investor, why you're an investor. And um, also understand that because of the federal illegality of cannabis, Glasshouse uh, trades over the counter or on secondary or tertiary Canadian exchanges, so can be very volatile and very liquid. So please just understand that. Please also know that I am doing this as a private investor and I have not been compensated by Glasshouse except for some awesome trucker hats, uh, occasional weed products, and uh, some t-shirts, by the way, to grandma that my wife loves. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's all. So uh, I want to just reiterate why I think Glasshouse is so fascinating. And I think what's really exciting to see is that more people are starting to recognize this, um, is that what Glasshouse is doing is very, very different than what other cannabis companies are doing and uh, really showing us what operational excellence looks like in cultivation. Uh, I think the big myth of cannabis is that you, it's easy to grow weed. Uh, it's not. Um, and as Graham has told me, it's like trying to grow an apple without its skin. Uh, it's incredibly susceptible to mold, pests, and disease. And what Glasshouse is doing is trying to harness God's gift to the environment, which is about 45 minutes south of me, um, in perfect weather, uh, a state-of-the-art greenhouse, and turning it on in sections to be able to offer really high-quality cannabis, but at a price that... Uh, no one can touch. Um, and then there's just a million reasons why, a uh, little million different reasons I hear on every single tour, or every time I go there, as to why Glasshouse has the lowest cost of goods sold and continues to drive it down. So Glasshouse's goal is just to be the lowest cost producer. Um, and that's why they're able to show 45, 50% sometimes 60% gross margins while competitors are announcing literally negative gross margins. Um, and so it's, it's really, really interesting just how it's, uh, how it's played out. Um, but I think this is a very differentiated story than most other cannabis companies. So that's my pitch. Uh, I don't know if you guys want to say anything before we jump into the questions, but. If, if I can uh, say, I, as someone who's been an investor for a very, very long time, I concur. It's not just what you should say as a legal to all investors. Hey, you know, be cautious and, and don't just take your, your opinion. What we've done at Glasshouse is tried to make it easy for people to go get their shoes dirty and to do the proper due diligence. Come see us. We want to be the, not only the proverbial Glasshouse, the real Glasshouse where if you are putting money, that's why on June 21st, you can come on out. You can get a tour from Graham and I. You can talk to Mark, talk to me, hopefully talk to you, and make your own determination with your own money. You wouldn't buy a house without going to see it. If you're going to make a, um, an investment into us, we really want to make sure we make it easy. And we appreciate, Aaron, like a true investor, you go out there and you ask hard questions. You you constantly go and update how does Glasshouse look? What are we doing? So I I wanted to let you know I agree with what you said, and we hope that investors will take us up on that and come on out. Plus, it's a fun day. Yeah, and I highly recommend it. Point. I, yeah. saying, I don't think anyone's been on any investors been to the farm more times than you have, Aaron. Um, if there's anybody out there from the investment community that's seen the evolution of what we're doing, I think you're at the uh, the top of the list. So uh, definitely doing your, your due diligence with your feed is important when you're talking about physical assets like this. Well, it's just been fun. You know, I'm not used to seeing uh, 
progression of really uh, a massive capital and uh, infrastructure project. And thanks Graham and Kyle and Mark and just watching the progress and, and what's, as a cannabis investor, I've been on the other side where companies are like, we're turning on this asset. We're going to enter this market. And then we're going to do it by this quarter or we're going to do it this year. And then it's over time, over budget. Oh, we had this delay and that, and we didn't get this piece of equipment. And I think, you know, and I was mentioning, I, I toured with you yesterday, Graham, uh, with another investor. And it's just been remarkable. It's really a credit to your entire team that you were like, hey, we're going to turn on this brand new greenhouse and you just do it on time, on budget. And then we're going to turn on- Real uh, quick, Aaron, ahead of time. In, in ahead of time. No, no, no. But now, no, no. This, this, this latest one is ahead of time. Like, I was shocked. I just took a video I posted on Twitter where it was like the flowers going into the drying room from the new greenhouse that was that was supposed to be turned on around March. It was, it's just really a credit to the team that you just keep doing these things. And I keep seeing these little differences every time I go, whether it's the drying and state-of-the-art drying and storage uh, this, you know, whole section that is like six million dollars of capex, or all of a sudden in the mother room, seeing the positive pressure uh, that you have in other parts of the greenhouses, to seeing the rows of desks with computers just from your propagation team, you just realize there's these continual advancements that it, it creates a flywheel for you, where other people just aren't going to be able to add these things it's just it's been very eye-opening to watch and, and so. please let's take that moment to really graham and i met with the team out in november when it was just a empty empty beautiful greenhouse but it had a ton of work to do a lot of equipment coming from holland um and then we had the holidays coming and we basically sat down and they gave us their best time that they thought it was even possible to get this turned on and then we put some bonus money on the table. They were kind enough to say, well, we want to include, Mark, you didn't, you didn't know about this. We want to include Graham and I in this pool of money. And both Graham and I were like, absolutely not. This is you guys. And it's per day if you can do it. And they they did it, Graham, remind me, it was like 20 days ahead of Yeah, uh, at, at least, yeah. Um, it was uh, almost, almost a full four weeks. And so for the rest of us as investors, that is our reward because they got a portion of the extra profit, the profit we, we made during those over 20 days. And so these guys are rock stars and um, I'm humbled by what they do out there. They're, we just have an amazing team. So thanks for seeing it. And thanks for even calling out that, that it's ahead. We wanted to make sure that, um, you know, should any of them be listening, they're, they're fantastic. Graham leads. It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty exciting that there's actually now uh, sections of the Greenhouse 5 that have been planted, harvested, and are already replanted again for their second growth cycle. It's uh, pretty pretty neat to see that, uh, that train running full speed there. And it leads to my first question is, I saw the racks of flour on the way to drying. It normally takes, what, about two weeks for drying? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so the first flower were, it's like two weeks away from when you're selling that, right? Or three weeks? Yeah. Um, what so do you first, expect? First flower from Greenhouse 5 um, will be coming out of the dry rooms right about now and heading to processing. Okay. So uh, it takes them a few days to trim it. So, I mean, I would I would expect that sales likely get, starts getting inventory from Greenhouse 5 by probably right at the end of this week. That's awesome. And then it'll just start ramping up from yeah, there, and, right? And the really neat, really neat thing about what we did in Greenhouse 5, which is, is a bit different than Greenhouse 6. Uh, Greenhouse 6 was also an incredibly you know, ambitious project, brand new site, licensing, uh, site preparation, nur nursery build out and all that was in Greenhouse 5. As we finished, we did as we finished the uh, retrofit on a section and then planted it as they were finishing the other sections. And, and different in Greenhouse 6, when we finished, we were truly finished. So what that means is that Greenhouse 5 is done. It is planted. Every gutter is filled. Every door is installed. 
um, the blackout curtains and everything is done. So that is that the greenhouse really now is fully planted, full speed. Um, and as I mentioned, has even had sections that are harvested and replanting. So on their second turn already. So uh, now that that train's running, it's running full speed right along with greenhouse six. And and we got it done. Um, you know, in part uh, thanks uh, to what Kyle mentioned and putting the goal out there, and in and, and majority in part to the team for delivering is now that greenhouse is fully planted right as we go into the best growing season of the year. So five and six, both running full speed right as we head into spring uh, in the summer months where we get our best yields uh, because of all the extra sunlight. Now, how do you expect that ramp of, of greenhouse five to go? Is it gonna be where you expect it to be like 100% going by a certain point this year? Or are you gonna be like holding some back uh, so, how do you um, expect that? To we'll, work? we'll definitely be leaving it all in the field, um, so we won't be holding anything back. That that said, I think there's there's two ways to think of the ramp up. One is in terms of output, and you know I'll call it quality and output, and then the other is in terms of efficiency. So um, anytime you're doing something new, you want to give yourself a, a little bit of room. We've got a whole bunch of new systems being used for the first time, etc. So we'll be conservative about you know, just, you know, call it the yield, right? So we won't necessarily expect that every plant grown for the first time in five is gonna match exactly what we've had two years of practice of in six. Um, now that said, very optimistic about five and incorporates things that we learn uh, from six. So I do think it will eventually be um, our, our best greenhouse to date, but we're gonna be conservative as we do things for the first time. The second way to think of it is in terms of efficiency, right? And, um, I think an easy example to think of is we do we hand trim a, a vast majority of our product. Um, we've got trimmers that have been trimming for in some cases five six years. To do the volume of greenhouse five, we need to hire new trimmers. We won't assume those trimmers are going to be as good as the people who've been doing it five years out of the gate. So we'll we forecast that their efficiency. Another way to say that is their cost per pound will be higher than an experienced trimmer. So. We've kind of built in some buffers for both of those. You know, that said, I think uh, you know, a few months of that, six months or so, and you should expect to see things running pretty on par with uh, what we've been doing for the last couple of years and six. Would and that that's a nice lead up to my next question. But just the startup costs that you mentioned uh, related to the ramp, is this part of what other startup costs that are because uh, you you were mentioning, hey, we're 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 uh, you even said on the conference call you expect to prioritize revenue over costs initially, and so could you just explain what that means as as you ramp up five besides trimming, what else is in there startup cost wise that maybe won't be in twenty twenty five when you lap it. Yeah, so maybe uh, there's probably two pieces in there. I'll take the operations and, and then mark on like the working capital side. So, so I think an easy way to, to keep going with the, the trimmer and, and example to think of it is there's kind of there's two ways that we could have approached it. We could have said, hey, we want to keep the cost fixed, and so we're going to accept 80% output from those trimmers. The other way, which is what we're doing, is we said we want to hit the output. So what we're going to do is we're going to be willing to spend 120% initially to get the full output even though it's going to be a little bit more expensive and we expect to bring that you know bring those costs back down as we find the trimmers are really good as they get experienced as we develop you know kind of the new new workflows in the greenhouse so basically what we're saying is rather than spending the same to get slightly less we're going to spend slight, slightly more to get full output gotcha and then, Mark, I don't know if you want to take the working capital side of just what the startup cost meaning from an accounting point of view. So we, uh, I mean, and just as a frame of reference, when I go back and look at like the ramp up for greenhouse six, um, it it uh, consumed, I mean, just say probably ten to fifteen million dollars of working capital during the I'm going to call it the first three to four quarters, just as you get inventory to where you want, you, you, you're buying supplies in advance of getting, uh, getting production, right? You've got, you know, all the extra costs in terms of getting the nursery going just to start feeding greenhouse five 
Um, I mean, to a large extent, much of that has happened, but as we get into the full ramp up, we're going to continue to consume working capital until we get to kind of that, that steady state. But the, the, the nice thing is even, even with incremental costs to basically, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say it differently. Um, you know, there's pressure on Graham and his team to process stuff as quickly as they're getting it. So we can get it to our wholesale people to sell it as quickly as they can sell it because we haven't been able to keep inventory. Um, you know, we're, we've been, again, consistently running with one to two weeks of inventory for the wholesale team to sell. So it's a race. And the fact that wholesale prices have, have held up nicely, you know, uh, means everything we can sell today as opposed to hold on to it for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks and let Graham's team catch up. We're just getting that cash that much faster. Um, maybe later in the year, we'll manage it differently. Um, but right now, you know, our wholesale team is uh, uh, needs more <laughs> biomass to sell. They're, they're gotcha. pretty much out. Well, that, that, and so just going back to the production side, is the idea that you're going to have the full impact of greenhouse five in Q3 that you're going to have a good, you know, like a really strong Q2, but the real impact will be Q3 or could it push to Q4 depending on how that ramp goes? What, what so do you expect? I'll, I'll, I'll let you, I'll give you like, just from a guidance perspective, yeah. if, if you look at, and again, you look at what we've told, uh, for the fiscal year in Q1 and Q2, you can then go, what's the second half of the year going to look like? And the, and the second half of the year production right now is, from a guidance perspective, up about 65% year over year. And we've said the new greenhouse will give us about 70% incremental production. Um, so in the second half of the, the second half of the year, our guidance assumes we're almost um, to the guidance we gave, but not quite, right? Um, gotcha. Again, we're still in learning. So, you know, hopefully if, if history is any indication, Graham and his team, once they start dialing it in, we'll start seeing those numbers improve and, you know, we'll change the guidance accordingly. But out of the gate, we, we, we felt comfortable with the numbers we gave for people to assume for, for 2024. And then if there's bad weather, we can we can blame Graham again, right? <laughs> it is a, it I, is a, well, not my fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, and don't, um, one other note on there, Aaron, is don't think there's there's two ramp ups happening, right? There's the ramp up of Greenhouse Five. There's also the seasonal ramp up that happens every year. So both of those things in this case are kind of layering over themselves, where you would expect additional yield. Heading going from Q1 to Q2 to Q3 and generally kind of you know even into Q4. So that's happening at the same time that Greenhouse 5 is layering on top of Greenhouse 6. I think that's actually a really important point I want to reiterate. I reiterate for everyone is you're mentioning that you have still lots of demand, you can sell it. And Graham, we were talking yesterday, you expect pricing kind of either stay where it is or just follow normal seasonal patterns. Um, but what's important for you is that the more sun, the better weather, the plant is more robust, the flower is bigger, the buds are bigger, and therefore the percentage of the plant that you sell for more, for higher dollar flower sells obviously a much, much higher price than trim. So, and, and the smalls and et cetera, but like your price, if pricing just stays flat or even goes down, your pricing will go up seasonally because you're just producing more flour. Is that? Yeah. More, more, more sunlight means more of all the above. And it generally means a, a an improved shift in the mix is what we usually call it, where you, with better sun, you get more, a bigger percentage of the plant in the higher dollar categories for trades is the average selling price. So Q2, Q3, you're just having more sunlight, greater percentage of flower. And so you have this wonderful effect of price, the price mix going up and volume going up at the same time. 
Yeah, and one of the nice with the with the low in Q one because you know we've gotten just a bunch of rain and uh, my house almost got flooded uh, three days ago uh, from that crazy rain we got. But it, and now it may not rain for you know six months or so. I, I just I'm saying that I know you guys all know this, but for people who aren't in California or in the Santa Barbara uh, you know, Ventura area, they may not understand. The, the the seasonal uh, effect. Um, so, I mean, I guess you answered me, you're not worried at all about selling this extra flower. You have the demand. You can't keep up with demands. Is that- I, mean, I, think I, would, I, I, would, I would take, right now, I would take um, higher inventory levels than we currently have because I think our sales team would actually be able to optimize a bit better if they weren't quite so hand to mouth. I mean, they're literally rationing uh, buyers products so that they can keep everybody with a little something right now. Um, so the ra ration, wait, wait, you're rationing your buyers? They're, they're, yeah, we, we're in wow. a period where people, the buyers can't have everything they want because there wouldn't be any left for some other people if we did that. So with Greenhouse 5, um, we get the extra volume that they're looking for. We also get to add uh, additional variety, which I think it will be helpful for the sales team. You know, essentially twice the space means that we can grow you know, twice as much of the same varieties or we can grow twice as many varieties. And so we're kind of doing a blend of that uh, where we'll be able to get a few more things on the shelf as well, which I think will be helpful for them also. And and Aaron, one other, again, one other perspective. Um, even in the fourth quarter of last year, I think we saw 280 cultivation licenses leave, which during that quarter, we, we estimate that's probably close to 2 million of cultivation square footage left in Q4. And so, you know, we're talking about bringing on, I'm going to say 700,000 feet of cultivation um, with, with greenhouse, um, with, with the greenhouse five. So we're still seeing, or we, you know, we're seeing capacity leave at our, if we look at what's expiring over the next during Q1 and Q2, the numbers drop dramatically. So we think we're in more of a steady state now, but, there's been more than enough capacity that's left in addition to what Graham just talked about to, to have the excess capacity come online. Yeah, if you think about it like that, like there, there's less total cultivation capacity in California now with Greenhouse 5 than there was when we started the project to bring Greenhouse 5 online. Gotcha. No, that's... Um, there's that's also on the, license, on the license front, there's another you know thing to keep in mind, which is out in the kind of June timeframe, which is not so far away at this point, there's a giant boa constrictor of licenses that are up for renewal, uh, many of those being on the provisional side. So uh, I think that's that's another trend to watch. The expectation is that not all of those will make it past the renewal period. So we may see another step change drop in total cultivation, license cultivation capacity out there in the next few months as well. Gotcha. Um... For the second straight year, kind of we had a weather disappointment uh, in margins in Q4. Uh, be, and I asked this last year, and I'll ask it again, is did we just expect that Q4 will be a wild card or that there may be weather issues or special issues that makes it so that Q4 isn't isn't as good as some of the other quarters outside of Q1? Should we um, consider like Q3 will be the best after that Q2, Q4, Q1? Or is it just that we're in the process of still ramping up and that eventually Q4 will be closer to Q3? Um, it's in, um, let's see. So the, 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 the issues were not the same. So I'm, I'm hesitant to just say that, you know, Q4 uh, uh, should always stay, um, you know, or we, that should be our expectations. Um, you know, I think we learned from both of them. Uh, one of the challenges um, with agriculture um, is that you don't get to learn, you, 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 you don't get to find out if you learned it until the next year. And it's always a little bit different, maybe if, if I uh, if I can articulate yeah. like that. So the first Q4 we had was a like literally the highest recorded history heat wave. And I actually think that if that happened now, not to say that we wouldn't have any impact and certainly not asking the weather gods for it, but 
it was that in a combination with the fact that we were brand new into the greenhouse um, and, uh, and you know, we found out that the pad walls were clogged and things like that. Now that's on the radar, new pad walls, better settings. I think we, we, I don't think you'd hear about it if that happened again this year. The next time it was this, you know, kind of, it was almost the opposite problem where we had no sun and it's warm temperatures and this really, you know, weird kind of humidity levels in that time. Uh, again, I think we learned from it. Um, that's a tougher one to fix. So like if you got that exact same scenario without mechanical dehumidification, uh, which is tough in a greenhouse, you might you know, still see things, but I'm not sure it's like, you know, Q4 just doesn't always stick, right? Like it's actually still yeah. one of the best quarters. And if you look at it historically, uh, the Q4 challenges that we had in the first year, we produced something like 75,000 pounds. The Q4 challenges we had in the second year, we were calling a hundred and something thousand pounds, right? So even even our even our uh, misses are still better year over year than they were. I mean, I think you know Q four this year was, if not a record, darn close to the record for total biomass produced, right? Yeah. So uh, the miss is is in is in a relative sense the miss. Is, our problems are better than they used to be. I, I would say this, Aaron. When I was a basketball player, I would have loved to have told my coaches that answer. That's fantastic. <laughs> Even my misses are, they're glorious. <laughs> I don't think your coach would have, would have uh, accepted that one. Uh, I, so I have a question for you, Kyle, uh, you know, and now uh, you go to strategy and kind of capital management side of the questions. I want to, I keep kind of asking this in different ways, but you have this crown jewel wholesale facility that's producing and, clear competitive advantage and then i look at cpg and i ask you know at least now why still produce cpg why not outsource it or shut it down or minimize it maybe you you have to some extent but i'm just curious as ceo what are your thoughts on cpg the landscape and just with your priorities how you think about it so you're that's probably privately one of the questions I get asked the most. Why, you know, you you could be TSMC and just focus in on making the plants cheaply. You've got a strategic advantage, just focus in on it. Why not do that? And I actually, the, a lot of times people will say TSMC. Um, and the, the big silicon chip manufacturer for those who don't know in Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, so, and then, you know, talk about capital allocation and what, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And what I would tell you is this, we made it, we made a decision a long time ago. And, and by the way, our decisions are not static yeah. uh, and, and they are subject to change, but, and we, and we're constantly evaluating, reevaluating, but right now with, I, I, as the top seller and cultivator in this, in the fourth largest market in the world, we are also vertically integrated. And we can now, what we think we have a unique position in a unique massive economy where two thirds of the market is illicit, that we can actually put it in our own packages, take it to those 10 stores. And again, same question, why do you have stores? And I would tell you that uh, we are now starting to use that vertical integration and we, you know, Graham and his team have worked very, very hard at pushing the cogs down on the CPG side. And we're now bagging our own, our own eighths, specifically trying to make it where we can sell something to an end consumer through our stores that is better, let's call it Apple Music, better only it's as cheap or cheaper in price to the consumer as Napster. So for $9.99, out the door, less than 10 bucks, out the door, you get a fresh aid from our facility. Is it as good as our Glasshouse Farms brand? No, but it's a damn good product. And it's probably the best value out there. And what we're hoping to do is attract those Napster users to come to Apple Music where you know we're not going to destroy your computer. You're going to feel good. You're not going to injure your lungs. And we stand behind it. So 
at least have you actually started could i go to the pharmacy down the block and actually get that today has that started absolutely okay. in all 10 of our stores we basically say you get legal tested flour fresh at cheaper than the illicit market and so that to us is the strategy and and the other thing that we've always felt is you win if you have the consumer in mind always and so to us we felt if we continue to push cogs down and we're not done yet we think we can push them down further but remember high tax california yeah. 10 bucks out the door that includes tax so at the corner where I, I am here in Long Beach, there's a store and they put $20 eights. That's pre-tax. So, and then by my other my other office here, it says $15 eights, which is actually not a bad deal, pre-tax. This is an outstanding deal. So we feel this, this will be a game changer. And we think this is how we make things better for the consumer. And we think this will change the trajectory of our CPG. And also it'll help our retail stores as well. And so hopefully this time next year, we're not having the same discussion. Now you're saying, wow, your margins kind of did what we did in cultivation when they were awful. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just, a, it was a difficult time. So that that's the way we look at it. Again, we always look, relook and check. Do we want to, you know, in the future when we can sell nationwide, it'll probably be nice to put it in our own bags and we'll get a little bit of a margin kick. That doesn't mean we couldn't just shut it down and then relook it in the future, like you suggested by your question. But at this point, we think we just we've built this vertical integration. We think it'd be short sighted to not at least see if we could make make this work through our own CPG and our own stores. Gotcha. Um, Aaron, one, one go ahead. To, that, to add to that, as you know, I've noticed that we have focused in and in intensified on a particular categories and brands where we think we have the most competitive advantage, right? So it's, it is now our focus is on the big three. It's glass house. It's all as well. And it's plus, um, you know, I think each of those brands have their own uh, customer segment. Each of those brands are doing well in the state, particularly, you know, as we've talked about with, with all as well, you know, Kyle makes the great point that that, that 999 you talk about, that's a, that's the conservative, price, right? Because that's out the door with all the egregious taxes in California. That product on the shelf is 750, call it, right? I mean, and for context, there's weed in Florida that's lower quality that's being sold to patients who need this as medicine for 10 times the price that we are selling Oswell here for in, in California. When, and we believe it's a win, not an if, the walls do come down, the way that we want to export or we grow to the rest of the country is not in bulk bags. It is in products like Allswell because we're thinking down the road as we always have as a company of this is, this is not the today solution. This is the what does the world look like in the next couple of years solution. And that there, just like you'd rather be a wine with an Apple label on it than a grape grower uh, who's no one never heard the name of. Here, we want to be growing our products, putting that California label on it and shipping it to the rest of the country in that format. And that's what we're working to build in parallel with all the other great stuff that we're doing in cultivation uh, and scale and capacity and cogs and things like that. Oh, great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, on to shifting to working capital management is a question for you, Mark. $23 million, if I have my numbers right, you can correct me, in cash from operations this year, 13 million came from working capital. Um, how did you manage to pull cash out of working capital while your revenue is going so up? Like how does I, that, I, I, and, and so, how should I think about it going forward? It's so, an impressive feat. <laughs> so we just like, if you, yeah, you know, the, the, the key, the key area. So, you know, um, inventory, we, we've talked a lot about an inability to keep inventory on our shelves for wholesale. Um, we have gotten significantly better over the last, I'm going to say, year plus of managing our CPG finished goods inventory in terms of working with a, um, uh, a supply demand plan to make sure we have buffers for our 
units and if we're we have too much dialing it back if we have too little stepping up production um so we we we've made good i'm going to say good progress in cpg and then retail you know we we retail is by far our most predictable business so we've actually been able to take inventory down part of it is because the demand has been strong at wholesale and we put improved processes in in place and again, just dialing back forbidden flowers and field is going to reduce, or that's helped us reduce inventory in, in our CPG business. So we were able to drive inventory down. Accounts receivable, um, our cycle in wholesale is 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 really good because you know we've only had you know we really have two customers that have terms that are, I'm gonna call it two weeks plus. Um, and we're really diligent if we're not paid on time, we're not shipping product or we're, we're not letting them come to the facility and, and pick up new product. We have a handful of customers who are generally on seven day terms. So when they come in to buy this week, they're making their payment for last week. And when they come in a week from now, they make their payment for last week. So we're really, our AR balances in wholesale continue to be very, very low. And on CPG, um, our, our balance for AR is much lower now or at the end of the year than it was a year ago. Um, part of that is we're managing it as opposed to Herbal managing it. And when we were selling to Herbal, the, the their AR balance was high. So we've done a really nice job and we're not taking on additional risk uh, on, on the AR side. And, you know, interestingly, as we finish the year, you know, a lot of other, I'm going to say other people, they're playing, I'm going to call it kind of year end games or quarter end games to, to maybe hold making payments. We haven't done any of that. Right. So where I think we feel good about our position in the industry of like, people like to deal with us because we pay our bills in a timely fashion. Um, gotcha. And then going forward this year, do you expect the peak working capital demand to be Q2 or Q3? Would you expect? Um, it's probably going to be Q2 um, just because that's, we start getting into a full, um, again, the full ramp cycle with inventory coming out of the wholesale business, um, which is going to drive most of it. Um, so I would just, you know, kind of year over year, I would expect right now as we look forward, we will use working capital this year on a, on a calendar basis because we are ramping up greenhouse five. Again, I, I would say it's probably going to be somewhere between 10 to 15 million, just that one time ramp up. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to say that if all the greenhouses are a similar magnitude, each greenhouse is probably going to use a similar amount of working capital, but 2020, Five will be very good because we'll now be in a steady state and we'll be in a position to maybe try to drive again working capital improvements. Gotcha. You mentioned, I think you mentioned, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're going to, you're expecting to get an employee retention credit. Yeah. Um, when do you expect that to come and how much is that? So uh, the the number is a, it's $11.5 million dollars. Um, I can tell you a now, nice amount. It is a nice amount, right? Um, and again, for for you know, from a guidance perspective, we haven't included that in any of our guidance because we really don't know when it's going to show up, and that's a difficult thing from a from a planning perspective. You know, we filed, but it should be by Q four, right? I yes, I would expect. I mean, I, I'm hearing nine to twelve months. So since we got our 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 filings in in basically September through November. I'm hoping we see some of it starting to show up in the third quarter, and by the end of the year, we have it all. So, okay, so, that's great. So, Aaron, real quick, predicting something that's going to come from the federal government can sometimes be tricky. Super easy. <laughs> Super easy. That's what I heard. Super easy. The, the, the one thing of note, um, we've been looking at the CR, e, e, you know, employers retenants tax credits ERTC for well over a year, and I would negotiate it with some of those shops that were like, hey, we'll do it for 10, 15%, you know, whatever, and could never get them off the dime. And finally, I will tell you, I was like, screw it. There's no way 
because there's a chance this hill gets clawed back in a few years. And that makes no sense to have paid 10 to 15% plus, plus, plus. Yeah. Later. So what uh, Mark, when we hired, um, I'm going to give a tip of the cap to Bernard Wang, who, by the way, was on that Alaska Airlines flight from Portland to the door plug. So oh. happily, uh, the, the plane stayed together because Bernard's a wonderful guy, but he found a tax attorney that did it for a fraction of that. Yeah. And she's a tax attorney. So we think we actually can stand up to some amount of scrutiny. We just don't know what, again, predict what the, the time is going gotcha. to on an audit in the future. But um, so we're really happy. The cost was not much. We do expect that we'll get that credit. And uh, but but as like everything else, we're extremely conservative about what we put in our numbers. Gotcha. And, um, when Graham on our tour yesterday, you mentioned the next greenhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, not to jump, but just kind of look into the future as you turn on. There are six greenhouses, right? You have two of them uh, turned on. The next one is a little more complicated and has light. Can you talk uh, just uh, whether it's Graham or any of you, how you think about when you might start working on it, the timing, um, sure. just yeah, I would love to just think longer term in the future of when we might see that greenhouse. Before Graham answers, let him take the first step. Graham may tell you this is the number one thing I keep asking Graham about. <laughs> it is. It's uh, it's, it's, uh, it's daily. So there's uh, we've been working on this for a while. Um, obviously, you know, we like what we're doing. We like the progress that we're making. We like the way it's absor absorbing in the market. Um, there are six greenhouses. The intention's always been to turn them all on for cannabis. Um, we are happy that we have a tenant on the on the veggie side for the greenhouses that we don't have in cannabis production yet. Um, you know that's rent covering costs, helping uh, reduce uh, carrying costs of things that we're that we're not using, et cetera. Um, that's a greenhouse two is next up on our list. It is a uh, unique even on the property greenhouse. Um, it's a similar size to the other greenhouses, but what is different about it? Uh, two things. One is it's not yet positive pressure in the ultra clima format. So that's something that's going to make us a bigger project than five and six, both which were already um, positive pressure. So it's going to have a lot more construction and permits and things like that that go into it. The big exciting part about it, though, is it's currently wired up with 11,000 thousand watt uh, at the present time uh, high pressure sodium lights, which means that it becomes kind of the best of both worlds. You get everything that we get for free from Mother Nature in greenhouse five and six, and then we have the opportunity to then add you know, essentially the same that they would add if this was in a warehouse uh, in Massachusetts, but we get to add it to Southern California's uh, sun. So we get the natural sunlight and then we get the add um, supplemental light. That supplemental light will increase yields. It should increase quality. It moves us into a different price uh, premium tier uh, within the market. It also takes out the seasonality of a lot of the seasonality that we see um, because we're now not solely relying on the sun, but we get the sun uh, plus the additional light. And then we get to turn those lights on in a very special way, which is per with power produced on site from our three cogens. We've got about 14 megawatts of power, which uh, for you know thinking about that, think about 3,000 homes worth of energy that we can produce on site by burning natural gas. Um, and unlike the power plant, which is actually uh, you know not very environmentally friendly because they burn the natural gas and they only use one of the three things uh, that come out of it, you get power, you get um, CO2 and you get heat. They typically throw away the CO2 and the heat and just use the power. At a farm, every one of those things is a valuable commodity for us. So we use the electricity for the lights, we use the heat to climate control the greenhouses, and we use the CO2 to supplement the, path the plants. So we can produce electricity far, le far more inexpensively than you could buy it from Southern California Edison, and you get free heat and free, OC, free CO2 in the bargain. So Turning on Greenhouse 2 is, uh, is going to be a big project. Uh, it's going to be a capital intensive project, but it's also a really exciting project because it is going to produce a product at a higher yield and higher quality uh, than anything else that we've had before. And, and Aaron, so one you, thing, yeah, one thing to think about. I think if you look at if you look at cannabis like saber metrics, indoor by to a lot of people, especially of the age where the police really jumped on cannabis cultivators and forced them to go inside warehouses to grow cannabis where people feel, hey, um, 
this is the best. I think we're looking at it the wrong way. And what is great about it is how much light consistently goes on the plant. So if you think about it, we could put the exact amount of light that you put on a plant in a warehouse and we can add sunlight on top of it plus a, a fuller spectrum that you can't really get from an indoor light. So I think when we're actually educating people about this indoor, I think that instead of calling it mixed light, I think you just basically flip it and say, let's look at how much light intensity is put on the plant during its flowering time. And I think those that make the best flower in the state of California indoor might be interested in taking a look at this. And as Graham said, this will be the one greenhouse that has lights that we won't face seasonality issues either. We won't see that, you know, the questions you asked about the fourth quarter, greenhouse, greenhouse two will, will largely uh, stay unaffected. Uh, so when, when do you think you might start that and how, do you have any idea of how long it would take considering it's going to be more intensive what, what, and there are permits? So what Graham and I agreed was, I think we're, you know, within about a week of, He's been working with his team to get a budget because you always have to start what's X, you know, how much money do you need? Yeah. Um, it will take longer time. Graham can, can speak to that. But first we, you know, we look at, okay, how much money is it going to take for both the CapEx and then the OpEx? And, um, and then, then it comes into where I, I'm usually on the balance sheet, like, okay, what's the best way to raise this money and what is the ROI and all that. So Graham time on this one, because, it's probably going to be one of our more difficult uh, greenhouses to play with here. Yeah, it is. It is definitely more involved um, than greenhouse five and six were, and that you know that was part of that was an intentional choice of going with the greenhouses that we could get up and running and generating revenue as quickly as possible, as with as little dollars as possible. Um, so you know, I'd say this is this is probably twice the project that those were. So you know, if we can get things uh, going this year, it's probably about twelve months or so. Um, to before you're putting plants into it because you are going to have like you know we did a retrofit think of it like that on five and six we didn't actually construct anything this has actual construction where you're adding lung rooms and reviewing heating systems and moving uh, water distribution systems and things like that to make it um, the the ultra clean a positive pressure that we really enjoy and then you've got the entire uh, you know capex and electrical infrastructure system that goes along with eleven thousand lights. Uh, consuming, you know, we'll probably put some LEDs in there so the consumption, power consumption will drop a bit, but you're talking megawatts and megawatts of power. So you add all that on top uh, as well. So, you know, I'd say it's probably, it's probably oh, if we're lucky, if we're lucky, it may be end of 2025, but probably the beginning of 2026 when you see the the greenhouse two, which would be the third greenhouse you see. Yeah, I'll, is, is, I'll, that, I'll, is that a I'll good be, I'll be slightly more optimistic than that. And like to, I'd like to say we've got uh, plants going into it in 2025. Oh, that's great. Um, on to capital allocation. Kyle, where <laughs> I, you know, I was telling you before we started recording, I keep expecting the bottom to fall out. I'm not used to uh, uh, just uh, how the stock prices have are obviously very different than, you know, 15, 18 months ago. Uh, we're on an up, upward trajectory. There's more investors who are starting to recognize what you have as special. We have some tailwinds from possible federal reform and rescheduling. How are you thinking about cash flow priorities? And specifically, we have warrants that are in the money from the preferred offerings, a healthy stock price. How are you just thinking about your capital needs versus, you know, the cash flow that is after Q3, it sounds like you'll be in a stable place and really start generating some cash, some, some real cash flow. I'm just curious that how you think as the steward of capital, um, how do you think about these things? Yeah, and share your thoughts. Yeah, so let me start with the debt side because that's always the one that can that can hang you. And and you know, you you I always appreciate the podcast. I think you sent me the one about the guy who built Cap Cities. Um some time ago I, I listened to that podcast and there's a great book out there called uh The Outsiders, talking about yes. cap application. And sometimes you have to one of the gentlemen used a ton of stock, 
built, you know, bought a bunch of assets and then spent his whole career basically buying back his stock and just built this mammoth company by being really smart with how he allocated capital. So when you, when you look at our balance sheet, we have two, two pieces of debt. One is the 50 million um, that we, when we did it, it was much more of a startup um, than, than we are today. Um, interest rates are higher, but banks care deeply about deposits. So I'm hopeful that we might find one of our banks that we talk to will be uh, will consider lowering that, you know, lowering our debt, changing it a bit. Uh, and the second one is uh, Plus Gummies. It's marked 12, 16 million bucks. It's 16. 16. We pay 8%. It can never call. We just figured at some point here when the stock price hits a number that we think makes sense, we can just we can roll it in at, at our discretion. So I don't even look at that as as uh, debt that I worry too much about. Uh, we so you can convert that Plus Gummy into stock. Anytime. I just pay it off. Oh, that, oh that's good to know. I I forgot, or I just, I didn't realize that. That's Yeah, good. and, and so. we debate it periodically, but, and we're probably, you know, we're, we're watching the stock closely. Um, and then now when it comes to the, you know, when we raise the B and the C, and I know, I know Aaron, you invested in the, in the B round, um, it's expensive and it has a pick. And, um, you know, we were mindful of, of that pick that's, that's continued to grow. The warrants are the warrants. So I don't, I don't think too much about those. And then we did a D to turn on this farm. And the way I look at it is um, we may go back out to the market. We're, we're still looking to see what, what do we do? How much is that X going to cost for greenhouse too? But at the end of the day, I think that it's a no brainer when you look at the cash on cash return on this capital allocation. If I have to raise it each time I've gone back to the market from the B and the C to then the D, the, the um, interest rate was lower even though interest rates in the market were higher and the strike price, the warrants were higher. And I would expect the same thing if we go back out to the market here, because our company is much stronger and we're, and we're building some cash. Yeah. And then once we have three full greenhouses at this facility, plus the other two greenhouses in Santa Barbara, um, we should be generating a lot of cash. And at that point, and who knows, we also may be on a, uh, a different market than the OTC where there's real volume and we have different opportunities to offer either a shelf or a discount on the stock to the folks that are in the B and the C, because we do want to pay those off. But I think we may have, again, it's an internal discussion. We're looking at all of our options, but with capital allocation, you can make a very, very, very good argument that turning on that indoor greenhouse um, will generate so much cash that it changes a lot of our options to take down the B and the C, which to me, it's more expensive than than our debt. And so I'd likely take that down and, you know, ultimately be a great situation to have the preferreds gone and the debt gone. I mean, I think that's where we'd like to we'd like to be. And then if we're in a cash position and we don't have other things to build, we would buy back stock as well. All those things are on the table. Yeah. All those things get discussed a lot. But um, the last thing I'll say is. My background is as a real estate person who repossession, repositions assets. So not only do I need the cash that I have to raise to buy a property, but then I have to forecast what is it going to cost in CapEx, OpEx, and timing to reposition that asset. And you never want to raise too little because that puts you behind the eight ball. And you don't want to raise too much because that just cuts into your your uh, your cash on cash return. Um, and so... We've been really good. This team has has done an amazing job of using the cash, hitting, you know, coming in on time and doing all those things. So that's how I'm looking at the world. I, I know I didn't give you a set answer that we're going to do this, this, and this. No, no, no. I wasn't looking. I would. I, that's actually more helpful. It's just the thoughts. But I guess when I was mentioning the warrants, is you know, as part of that first preferred and and the full disclosure you mentioned, I'm an investor in the B preferred the D preferred, the common stocks, the original warrants. I mean, I, I have a little piece of everything, but when I to think about the warrants there, the you have a, a small amount of warrants that are at $5 that are in the money. You have another warrants that are in six, and especially you get a rescheduling. What I was thinking is more of like, uh, I remember Air Wellness, they had warrants 
and they wanted, they were like, hey, you know, we've got these warrant holders. A lot of them are common shareholders. We can provide an incentive so that they convert for cash. And then you don't have to go through this rigmarole of like a offering or something else. And then this cash, and they, it was wildly successful. Um, and I was just, I didn't know if you were thinking of something like that. You start getting to 850 possibly $10, $11, and then you have those warrants at 1150 Who knows what happens with rescheduling? There's some word that people are saying that with the rescheduling, you could list on a major exchange. I would imagine your stock would be very different from 850 I, I'm just curious if you've thought about that or that's also on the table. Um, 100%. We've talked about, you know, uh, Mark, who has been the CF. CFO of other publicly traded companies on senior exchanges. You know, we, we bounce things by him, some of the things he's seen. We talk to investment bankers. And so, um, as you can imagine, um, we've sort of plotted along and been trying to be as smart as we could with cash, trying not to do anything stupid. Um, but yeah, that, that also, and, you know, we know the air guys as well. So we're just, all those things are on the table. Um, gotcha. We, you know, you didn't mention a shelf. Aired used a shelf when their stock was in the 30s. That was also wildly successful. So, um, I, I was, not necessarily how they used their money. <laughs> how they uh, used that I, shelf. The capital allocation, I agree. <laughs> but, but the the ability to raise capital at a at a very good value. For yes. The company was was fantastic. And so yeah, for sure. But, for sure. but again, you you've been in real estate. You've had some very successful yes. in real estate. And so you have to think about, you know, yeah. if you're going to raise the cash, you, of course, you want to use it wisely. And so for us to retire some of this, it's in our heads and we're talking about what looks like. And if this makes, then do we do that? And so we have a sort no, of. No, it's great. Yep. So and just Aaron, one other thing, too, on the warrants, the the, the B's and the C's, uh, all, all B, C's and D's, they're all in the money right now. Um and um, they all have a cashless exercise option. So if, you know, if, as I think about what happens to those warrants, I'm assuming no cash from those warrants and I'm assuming everyone is gonna use the cashless option. Um, they're 14 million outstanding. We can actually call them when they get to $12 and, and force, uh, force the conversion when the share price hits $12. Um, so, I mean, I would, of the 14 million, uh, again, I'm not expecting any cash to come in. So I would assume when we hit $12, we'll end up issuing, I'm going to say, you know, seven-ish, seven and a half million shares at that point. But this is what, what, what Air did is they offered like a concession of 50, I think right. it was 50 cents per warrant and almost everybody converted for cash right. for that yeah. extra inducement. It's just an interesting, I, I, I just wanted to yeah. know you guys were thinking about it, yeah. but that, that's fine. Um, and it's a good problem to have compared yes. to where we were 18 yes. months ago. Um, I wanted to go back to a comment you made, Kyle, about you might be able to get a lower rate. Are you basically for your senior secured lender, that 50 million, do you think there's good chance that you may be able to refinance that or get a, a new lender in where it's a little less restrictive or a better rate? Or did I understand that right? You did. Um, and I would say this, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put odds on it. We're in discussions with some, some banks and uh, this is where I've made my living on the you know, a lot of these relationships I brought into this from real estate, that's sort of how I, you know, I, I own some of the balance sheet. Like Whitehawk was introduced by one of those lenders before they were comfortable really getting into the space other than banking. And so now they don't want, as they feel Schedule 3 is getting much closer, they don't want to lose uh, our deposits. And so um, we're talking to them. And, and again, there, there's a few banks out there that are very interested and, I mean, our debt on our, if we just use our three farms as collateral um, with our most recent appraisal, which was like December, it's like 30 LTV or something. And that's before we turn on greenhouse too. So it's, it's a pretty conservative real estate loan. And um, so I would say this, I'm hopeful and okay. 
Uh, that would be good news. That would be great. But but again, as Mark said, right now we're going to pay off about seven and a half million of amortization in 2023 if nothing happens, and about the same in sorry 2024, 24. same in 2025 and 2026. And if that happens, the worst case scenario is we keep it at you know 12 and change on the you know on the uh, interest rate, and we pay down the loan, and that's not a bad right. thing either. I just think that I'd rather not allocate the capital to amortization. I'd rather get, if I get another year or two of IO, that saved money can go to greenhouse. Right. Now, you, uh, there's still the ongoing, it's a little more stable, but there's been a lot of wreckage in California. I'm sure you're shown deals or acquisition opportunities all the time, all the time. Uh, Kyle. Um, do you feel like there's any opportunities of something that's additive to green, to Glasshouse or keeping your head focused? How do you think about just what's gone on and continuing to go on in California in terms of maybe adding something on or not? You know, I know you always want us to add to our CPG. Our <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say this, as the um, opportunistic investor that I've always uh, prided myself on, you know, right now, Retail and uh, and brands are both getting kicked in the teeth in this state. It, it's their reckoning now, while well, before it was cultivation's reckoning. And so there are very good opportunities out there. Um, you know, I saw I saw some rolling of some brands that I'm I'm um, very fond of that uh, uh, Mammoth bought. I, I I congratulate them. I think they got a couple of good brands, but I think for us. Uh, you saw that we, as Mark mentioned, we took two brands off and said, nope, let's yeah. focus on these. Um, I don't I don't know if I've said to you, but I've said on some different times I've spoken and, and there's a couple of different podcasts. I don't believe any cannabis retail is anything other than a write down in the future anywhere in the country. I just, it's, it, you know, in the future, you're going to, we're going to be selling this stuff in, in convenience stores and you know, and there won't be, you don't need a, um, a BevMo for cannabis. And right now we're living in this prohibitionary time. So I think a better, a better use of our um, vertical and providing really good opportunities for the consumer, value for the consumer, would be to help some stores that we think are um, like-minded like us and see if we can help manage their stores which would then we think drive up their revenue and um, increase their margins. So I think that's the opportunity. Wouldn't cost us any cash. More um, like managed services. Yeah. Managed kind of services, thing. which yeah. is, you know, one of my backgrounds, you know, I own a company that yeah. Yeah. manages several billion dollars worth of, of real estate. And I know how to provide good value to the equity holders and owners of, of that real estate. So um, that's kind of what I would I would say is the best opportunity. All that said, we, we, we're always good listeners. We're good fiduciaries. Um, and we'll consider what comes down the pike. But as, as of right now, I think just really staying focused in on what makes us money and what makes us, you know, what helps increase uh, value to our shareholders is what, where our focus gotcha. is today. Are you guys hearing anything, any movement or anything on interstate commerce? So um, federally, we haven't really heard anything. Um, we're not sure that the MSOs are really in favor of it. I think a lot of them uh, really are trying to hold on to this kind of prohibition, prohibitionary landscape. Um, and the argument is it would save jobs and it would save their capital allocations. Um, I would tell you, it's weird how government doesn't care about capital allocations because the poor investors of MedMen didn't get saved. So I, um, but I would tell you that I think what's going to happen is we're going to get a schedule three and we're going to see the ice start cracking on um, federal, uh, on interstate commerce through state compacts. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, I think you did to add to that, I think all, all the same you know, kind of basic fundamental reasons that interstate commerce makes sense, continue to make sense, and if anything, make even more sense, right? I mean, we talked about the disparity in price between our quality $7.50 
eight for patients in particular, but consumers in general compared to 10 prices that are 10x that in New Jersey. Um, I think one of the things that people don't talk about or recognize enough is that bans on interstate commerce are an environmental travesty for cannabis because what it forces people to do is build silos in states that have no legitimate business growing this plant, right? I mean, again, this isn't even cannabis specific. There's a reason that oranges grow in Florida and cherries come from Michigan is because that's where those plants fundamentally like to grow. And if you try and grow a plant where it doesn't like to grow, to achieve, to do it, means that you are fighting with nature. And that's almost the definition of an environmental travesty, right? But I know we've talked about it, but Massachusetts using 10% of their electrical grid powered by coal to grow in a warehouse to recreate what we get here in Southern California for free with no right. environmental impact at a lower cost, a better value for the consumer. Like that is not that is not good for society. And that is what the government and these overall rules should be focused on delivering. So I think the, the governors, I mean, you, you see new states. This again, this isn't just a California wants to export thing. Arizona recently passed committee on a, on a, on a bill to add interstate commerce to them. New Jersey Senate, uh, the president of the Senate reintroduced a bill for interstate commerce for them. California, Oregon, Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. just opened up their first five stores that moved from the, you know, kind of gray market gifting economy to actually uh, licensed. But where do they get their product from? There's not a supply chain in Washington, D.C., nor should there be one. So no one should be building them. So Washington, D.C., I think will be saying, hey, we want legal retail but we don't necessarily want their need to incentivize people to build warehouses to grow weed in Washington, D.C., when California has better product, lower cost, better value, lower environmental impact, right? So again, the federal government has not yet done anything to help uh, legalization. It has been 100% led by the states. I think it will be continuing to be led by the states, but when Schedule 3 does happen, it is gonna have far more reaching cascading effects. It's gonna open the doors for a whole bunch of things um, we've heard now from the New York Stock Exchange, as well as the NYSE, that Schedule 3 is the hurdle that they're looking for for uplisting. There's no reason they can't list it today. So the fact that they've self-determined that this is the hurdle, we think that's coming. And when that comes, there's going to be capital and capital motivates capitalism. And capitalism is going to be better if interstate commerce uh, starts happening in cannabis. So I think the forces are only building for it to happen and develop, expected to be, and, and far sooner than many people think. And for you, Aaron, as an investor, you're looking at the the, the landscape. Let's call it, let's call the black swan interstate commerce descheduling. It happens. If you're a glasshouse investor, that black swan is fantastic. If you are growing at $800 a pound in a warehouse, that's awful. You're now you you are now you have write offs everywhere. So that's that's sort of the way we we look at it as. None of our numbers, as always, are extremely conservative. It's just a free call option. So when that black swan event happens, which is what we're building to, we don't think that our prices go down because we're already in the toughest market in the, in, the, in the world. We think our prices only go up, plus the delivery charges. And we're going to put it on shelves, as Graham mentioned, Florida. We're going to put it on shelves a lot cheaper than the, and we're going to make more money then it costs them just to get it out of the uh, warehouse. Don't forget sending it to Germany. And Germany, of course. That, yeah, that's, right. that's always top of mind. <laughs> uh, last question. You guys have been very gracious with your time, and I really appreciate it, as always. Kyle, you're doing uh, some great work on prison reform efforts. Uh, can you give us an update on just – any progress or your work on that and how rescheduling may change to just get some nonviolent uh, cannabis prisoners out of jail. So you're very kind. I've spoken a lot about it. I grumble on Twitter all the time about it, but I my efforts have, have turned into zero tangible result, results today. And that's what's most frustrating because I'm in communication with Parker Coleman, who's got almost 50 years to go, 50 years. Um, and uh, Jose Valero Jr., Ali, uh, sentenced to seven years. So he's now in, he's almost done two years for less than eight pounds. And you, you know how many pounds you and I were just talking about, what you saw yesterday on your walk. 
Uh, and then there's Jerry Heyman, who's up in Lompoc from uh, from the Fresno area, and um, and he's serving his, his sentence up there. And his is even the most ridiculous of all of all of those. Um, and to answer your question, you know, I spoke to Weldon at length yesterday. Weldon Angelos, who uh, former former prisoner himself, so 13 of a 55 year sentence, who runs Mission Green. Um, April is second chance month. Um, he's having good conversations with the pardon attorney. We, and I hate hope as a strategy at this point, but there's only one person on this planet that can take a pen, sign it about 3000 times and release all these folks and even fully pardon them if you wanted to do so. And, um, unfortunately, you know, Washington DC is, is a complex, if not corrupt place. And, we're, we believe that the reason we believe that something's going to happen because it's unfucking believable that it couldn't happen with all that's going on in this country. And I'll be down at Benzinga in Miami talking to, with a, I mean, between us, we grow millions of, of pounds of cannabis legally. And it's, it just blows my mind. So I guess my rant aside, um, we're hopeful that something happens that's an election year. There's all kinds of reasons to believe that Mr. Biden and some of the comments from Ms. Harris uh, will um, will result in the first cannabis prisoner being let out of prison. And I want to make sure it's clear. So far, President Biden has only virtue signaled because he pardoned people that were not in prison for possession, simple possession. Decriminalizing or descheduling simple possession is like saying, I am I am going to pardon everybody who used the word cannabis in a sentence. It's meaningless, unfortunately. So that's that's where I am frustrated, angry, uh, but remain hopeful that the president and the vice president of this administration will finally do the right thing. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much, guys. This has been great as always. Congrats on the progress. Keep up thank the great work. Thanks, Thanks, Aaron.